I don't know if you've ever had a season in your life where the question popped into your mind where you're like, is God really big enough for this situation? Maybe it's a moment of crisis. Uh, It could be financial, relational. It could be illness, sickness. It could be a multiplicity of different things. But sometimes, I'm going to say almost for every single human being, there's going to come a moment where that question comes up, is God big enough? Is he powerful enough? Is he willing enough to come and bring breakthrough in this situation in my life? That's part of what we're going to be exploring today as we continue our series in Mark. We're actually going to be looking at four different stories. We're only going to look at them, three of them very briefly, one a little bit more in depth. But as we look at these four stories, Mark's really answering this question. How powerful is Jesus? Is he really who he says he is? Can he do the things that he claims that he can do? Now, Mark, remember, began his whole gospel by saying, hey, I want, I want you to meet someone. Let me introduce to you this guy, Jesus. And in Mark verse 1, he says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. He's going, this is the man. This is the one with all power, all authority. And the question he answers throughout the gospel is, is he really? Prove it. Let me see it. And one of the things that Mark does I just love so much is as he's introducing Jesus to us, it's, it's less about in Mark's account of Jesus' life, it's less about Jesus' teaching. We get it and we get some parables, but a lot less of it compared to the other gospels. It's more about his doing. And we're going to see Jesus in action quite a bit this morning. The four stories that we look at this morning is one, Jesus calming the hurricane. Two, Jesus casting about a thousand demons out of a guy, possibly more. Three, Jesus healing a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. And fourthly, Jesus showing the ultimate power by raising a 12-year-old little girl back from the dead. Power power, power. Before we can look at those stories, we got to actually back up to like the beginning of time. Because in order for what Mark's doing today to really make sense, we've got to understand the meta narrative of what's been going on. Back in the garden, right? Back in, in Genesis, like Genesis 1 verse 1 said, in the beginning, there was God. And he created all things. He created the garden of Eden, created the world, created the universe, and created mankind. He says, it's good. It's beautiful. It's perfect. That lasted about five minutes until humanity screwed the whole thing up. We chose to rebel against God, to choose our way instead of his way. Essentially, we wanted to be the boss instead of him. We'll figure out what's right and wrong. Nobody's going to tell me what's right and wrong. I'm going to figure that out for myself. That's what Adam and Eve did when they ate the fruit. Now, because of their sin, God fulfilled the promise that he made. He said, look, if you choose that, There's going to be a curse. There's going to be death released on you and the entire planet. And that's exactly what happened in the fall. This curse of death caused by sin wasn't just something that humans experienced. Animals began to experience. Every aspect of nature itself began to come under this curse of death. I mean, we see it, right? What happens to an apple if you leave it out for for a few months on a counter, right? Why did that happen? It's the curse of death. I mean, I don't know how it was in the garden, but I imagine you could pick an apple and just leave it there, come back next year, and it's still ready to eat. (laughs) But death and decay began to take place, right? And it affected all things. But God, from the very moment that Adam and Eve sinned, the moment that mankind fell, gave a promise. He said, I'm not going to leave you in this condition. I'm going to send a savior. He's going to come. He's going to crush Satan under his feet. He's going to come and restore and and renew everything that death has touched. He's going to come and, if you guys follow baseball, reverse the curse. And he's going to change everything that has been touched by death. This is the promise that God had made and then reiterated all throughout the Old Testament. Mark comes And as he's writing about Jesus' life and he says, okay, that guy that God promised would come and reverse the curse, that's Jesus. And his readers are like, okay, we'll prove it. Let me see how powerful this Jesus is. Can he really do the things that God has promised that he would do? And Mark's answer is, yes, let me show you. And so we see Jesus in this first miracle demonstrating power over nature. 
And the story beginning in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, is Jesus tells his disciples, hey, let's get in the boat. We're going to cross, cross over to the other side. And they're leaving kind of Jewish territory, heading to Gentile territory. They get in the boat. Jesus is tired from like a full schedule agenda of ministry. He's just wore out. Shows really the humanity of Jesus in that moment. He gets a pillow and takes a little nap. How many of you are like power nappers, right? Not as powerful as Jesus. Because a, a hurricane comes up. And these are, you know, some of these are like professional fishermen. They've been on the water their entire life. They think they're going to die. So this isn't just like some mamsy pamsy storm. This is like big time. Jesus is power napping through the whole thing, right? I mean, talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want, I want that. And so he's just napping and the disciples wake him, shout in his face. And the first question they ask is the same question we so often ask ourselves when we're in the midst of pain or chaos or fear or a situation that just feels so out of control. Don't you even care that we're about to die? It's like, Jesus, what are you doing napping when I'm dying? And sometimes we feel that way. God, are you even, are you even aware of what's going on in my life? And Jesus gets up, looks around, and it says he rebukes the storm. In the Greek, it's, it's kind of the same picture of like a dad rebuking a two-year-old son that's throwing a tantrum. Like, just stop it. Be quiet. And then in that moment, the storm obeys. Nature obeys Jesus, the creator of all nature. And it wasn't just like the wind stopped, right? If you've ever been on a storm on a body of water, the wind can stop, but the waves keep going for a bit. It says that not only did the wind stop, but it was perfectly calm, instantaneous, glassy, perfect morning for like wakeboarding. If you've ever been on a lake, you're just like, instantaneously. And it says that the disciples were more afraid after Jesus had calmed the storm than they were before when they thought they were going to die. Why? They just came into contact with the raw power of God himself over nature. And Mark's saying, okay, the promise God has made is that he's going to remove every part of the curse of death that's touched nature itself. We'll get imagery of him saying, like, the lion is going to lie down with the lamb. He's going to turn the waste places, the desert, into, like, beautiful garden where roses are going to grow. Like, he's going to restore and rejuvenate nature itself, the planet itself. And we're like, well, how do we know you can actually fulfill that promise? Because we just saw Jesus display authority and power over nature. So they get off the boat. And they come to the, to the other side of the seashore. And this is a story we're going to look at more in just a moment. And we see Jesus demonstrating power over the demonic. You know, Jesus made a promise, my kingdom's going to come. I'm going to crush Satan under my foot. How do we know you can do that? Because we just saw Jesus demonstrate power of the demonic. He goes on from there. They go back to the other side. Boop, 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 back and forth. And when they get off at that side, a crowd forms around them. And this woman, as, as Jesus is going to actually heal another man's daughter, this woman who's had an issue of blood, a disease that's been causing her to bleed continuously for 12 years, reaches out, touches the hem of his gar garment instantaneously. She's healed. And Jesus, because he's all-powerful, immediately senses that power has left from his body and goes, who touched me? And the disciples are like, everybody because there's a crowd around you. Everybody says, no, 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 somebody touched me. Who was it? Sees the woman. He says, daughter, your faith is beautiful. Your faith has made you well. What is that? Jesus coming and reversing the curse of sickness. I've got power over that. And then he continues his walk, and he goes to Jairus' house. And his little girl isn't just sick. Now she's dead. And, and it's like, what are we going to do? Does Jesus have power even over that? Because that's what God promised. He said he's going to reverse the curse of death that has touched every aspect, even us. Does he have power over that? And he comes this little girl and he says, Talitha kum, I tell you, little girl, get up and walk. Just rise. She wakes up and Jesus is like, shh, don't tell anybody. We don't want to embarrass her. Go make her some mac and cheese. She's a little tired. You know, she's been dead for a bit. It takes, you out, you know, takes it out of you. Go get her some food. Right? Power, power, power over and over and over again. And this is what Mark is showing us. Jesus has the ability to fulfill what God has promised since the very beginning. 
to restore all things that death has touched. And he does it so wonderfully. Now, why is Mark making this case for us? I promise we're going to get into the story. But why is he actually doing this? In part, he's wanting us to raise our expectations. It's interesting. Mark has a certain type of logic that he's expecting his readers to enter into. It's the same logic, logic that Jesus actually demanded from his disciples. And the logic goes like this. If you've seen Jesus exercise power in one area, whether it be over the demonic, over sickness, over nature, even over death, the requirement upon our thinking from that point on is to expect that Jesus will, will demonstrate that same kind of power on any other area in your life. We're going to look at this extensively next week when Jesus basically rebukes the disciples and like, hey, you saw me do this miracle. And then he expected them to do a different miracle that was completely unrelated. He's like, but you saw the power over here. Come on. And so Mark, what he's trying to do, he's like, guys, I'm raising your expectation. If you see Jesus have power over nature and over sickness and over death and over the demonic, then you all need to expect that he's going to do the same thing in your life. If there's an area that death has touched in your life, your natural response, supernatural response as one who's been saved by Jesus is to expect that he's going to come and reverse the curse in your life as well. Amen? Now, let's look at our story. The one story we'll look at in depth. This is Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes. Now Mark makes it sound like they have this, you know, just like nice, like little row across the lake. You know, I almost picture from this sentence, like they're in one of those little swan boats with the little pedals and they come across and like, wow, Jesus, that was so refreshing. No, they just came from a near-death experience. I mean, I don't know if you've had a near-death experience, but the adrenaline rush that happens, right, doesn't leave instantaneously even though the danger is past. You're like, whoa, we didn't die. It takes hours. So the disciples are getting to the other side, and they're, they're like way up here. They're on high alert. Their skin is sensitive. All this adrenaline is still pumping through their body. And they're leaving a Jewish part of town and going to a Gentile part of town. And why is that significant? In part, their mindset probably was, oh, good, there's nobody here that knows about Jesus. Maybe we'll get a break and we can come down from this experience we just had. And then look what happens. Verse, uh, where'd it go? Verse two, when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with the chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Here the disciples are wanting a break, and what comes to meet them? This crazy, maniac, demon-possessed guy who's shrieking. If you look at Luke's account of the story, we're told that he's naked. So you got this naked, demon-possessed, crazy guy shrieking and groaning and yelling at the top of his voice, running towards him. Can you imagine what that would do to you when you're already on an adrenaline high? Ah! And this is, what, this is what happens, right? Now, Mark gives us such a key phrase. It says, no one was strong enough to subdue him. They tried. They would come, you know, be like a group of guys, like a mob, like, okay, get them. Oh, I'll get them all. You know, they're like they're all jumping them. You can imagine maybe they're like hitting them with the rock, like doing something just to knock them out long enough to shackle them. Like, we can't kill the guy, but maybe we can just shackle him. Like, they just don't know what to do with this guy. He's crazy. He's out of his mind. He's dangerous. Matthew 8, 28, his account of the story says that he and a companion that was with him were so violent that everybody in town knew not to go that way. This is a messed up guy. When, when Luke says that he was naked, it's, it's kind of a code word in scripture for sexual perversion. This is a guy who's done a lot of evil, disgusting, terrible, murderous, violent things in his life. And it's the demons at the controls. And it says, when Jesus climbed out of the boat, that guy came running at him. Verse 5, day and night he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. The demons were driving him uh, towards violence against other people, but also violence against himself. They were just driving him to self-harm, self-hatred, cutting. It's not a new thing. 
The demonic has been pushing people towards it for generations. This guy is essentially just a sociopath. He's got no regard for what's right or wrong, no regard for other people whatsoever. And I love this because which way did Jesus choose to pass? Right? It's just like, it wasn't like Jesus was unaware. He knew where he was going. And it's so challenging to me because here's Jesus essentially going, look, there's nothing too dangerous, nothing too violent, nothing too vile for me. Nothing's too messy for Jesus to step into and fix it. Now, there's a lot of things too messy for me to step into. (laughs) At least I feel like they are. And I'm so challenged by this because so often in my life, I see myself avoiding messes. Well, that's a messy person. I don't want to go there. I've heard rumors. Don't go to that part of town, right? And yet Jesus walks straight towards it because that's where God said he was going today. The Father said, that's where you're going. Point your boat in that direction. Here's a mess for you to clean up. Now the story continues, and you can almost imagine this guy up in the tombs, right? And we're told um, from all three accounts from the Gospels that the tombs were kind of up perched on a hill looking down towards the water. And so you can imagine this guy on his perch where he normally is sitting in the tombs, and he sees some fresh victims come in the boat. He's like, oh, these guys must be tourists. They don't understand. They don't know they're not supposed to come this way. And he says he runs down towards them thinking, I don't don't know what he was thinking, thinking here's some guys maybe I could kill. Who knows what was going on as the demons were, 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 you know, charging this guy up. And he's running towards Jesus. Then all of a sudden he gets to a point where he can see who's actually coming. And this is where we pick up in verse six. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. All of a sudden, this man recognizes Jesus. He goes, this is a guy I've known for thousands of years. He goes, what do you mean? The demons inside of him knew who Jesus was. Actually, in the Gospel of Mark, the demons tend to have the best theology out of anyone in the entire book. They knew he was the son of God. They knew what was about to happen. And he's running towards them, and out of absolute terror and fear, They bow down before Jesus. It it reminds me of the verse that says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, whether they want to or not. There's that day coming. And look at, remember Mark said, nobody could subdue him. And yet here he is, completely subdued at the feet of Jesus with no chains. It's just completely the power of Christ that has subdued the demons inside of this guy. Continues verse 7, with a shriek, he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Such good theology. In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. This is hilarious to me. You've got demons who hate God in a moment of crisis calling out to God in order to save them from God. And you're like, these demons are so dumb. But we do the same thing. I mean, how many of you can remember a moment when you didn't believe in God? You're an atheist, and yet you came to a crisis. What do you do? I begin praying to this God I don't believe exists. We do it. I adjure you, in the name of God, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Now, Legion was anywhere from about 5,500 to 6,800 Roman soldiers in this day. Now, we don't know exactly, like, was there really that many, that, that many thousands of demons inside this guy? We have no idea. But there is, there is a lot. Can we all agree? This guy had some critters. It's basically what, what this is saying. My name is Legion because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. They're going, don't don't make us leave this place. Like, this is perfect for us. Remember, they're in Gentile territory. These These are an area where all these people are worshiping not the true God, but false gods. Essentially, they're worshiping these demons unknowingly. And they're like, this is the perfect place for us to wreak havoc. Don't make us leave, Jesus. We're having too much fun. Please let us stay. Verse 11, there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. Now, this is so fascinating. 
It's not what I would have done if I was God in this moment. I probably would have sent them into the abyss. But Jesus gave them permission, verse 13. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. The, the theological term for this is suicide. It's the first recipe for deviled ham we ever see in all of history. I know the jokes go on and on. It's terrible. It's terrible, I know. But you got to ask the question, why, why did Jesus let these demons do it? He casts them out of the man with the word, sends them into the pigs, and the demons do in the pigs exactly what they have been doing in the man for years. And they actually push him towards death, push those pigs towards suicide, right? And there's a lot of conjecture on why Jesus did it. My personal opinion is I think Jesus was willing to allow there to be a cost for this community, this town, for the salvation of this one man. In some ways, I think this was a test for the town. What are you gonna value more? The loss of these pigs or the life of this man? And I think we all have honestly face the same test every day. What are we gonna value more? People or possessions? Our own comfort or the souls of the people around us, right? And so Jesus, maybe that's the reason, maybe not, but, but That's what he does. Verse 14, the herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rush out to see what had happened. I mean, wouldn't you? Hey, there's 2,000 pigs that just jumped off a cliff. You gotta come see it. Like, sign me up. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. And you go, okay, this is the moment where they rejoice. Like, oh my gosh, the power of God just saved this guy. This is insane. Jesus, hang around. Like, can you do the same thing in our lives? Like, tell us who you are. No. It says, he was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. And you know, that's such a weird response. Not really. It's actually quite natural. The disciples just had it in the boat. They were terrified. Why? Because they just witnessed the raw power of God himself descending upon their situation. Isaiah had a similar experience in Isaiah 6 when Isaiah the prophet's called. He's in the very throne room of God. He realizes that he's seeing God Almighty and he says, woe is me, I'm a dead man because I'm a man of filthy lips. Essentially saying, get away from me, God. Like, I can't, I can't. Peter did the same thing when Jesus called him and did the miracle of of all these fish being gathered when Peter was unable to catch any. He falls to his knees before Jesus and says, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. When sinful men and women come in contact with the holy God, there's this natural response that says, "I, I can't be, I can't. You're too good, you're too holy, and I'm not, right? And, and the same thing's happening. There's this fear, this awe, this wonder at the raw power of Jesus breaking into their lives at this moment. But the response was not something we should ever mimic. Then those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. This was a value judgment that they just made. Seeing God break into our situation is too costly. And we don't want to leave, we don't want to lose the pigs. We don't want to lose our livelihood. We don't want to be inconvenienced like that. I'm more concerned with those pigs than I am with the life of this man. Essentially, what they're saying is I'd rather this guy be naked, cutting himself, the crazy guy that's trying to kill everyone, and we still get our pigs. It's a value judgment. We have to realize that seeing the work of God in our town is going to cost us something. And are we willing to pay the price? We said at week one that the priority that Jesus sets is always people, period. What are we willing to pay? What cost are we willing to pay to see people come into a saving relationship with Jesus, to see their lives restored? Is there something that we're holding on to that we're like, this is too precious to me to, to, to let go of. This cost is too high. Lord, I value this thing more than that person. Is it your reputation? Is it your comfort? Is it money? Like, what is it? And Jesus is like, 
why don't you just surrender that to me? Now, the story gets crazier, and you're kind of like, can this get any wilder? It does. As Jesus was getting into the boat to leave, he did his thing, the whole town rejected him, and the man's just like there, right? Clothed and sane now. And Jesus is like, all right, my work's done. He was getting into the boat. The man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. This man was not going to live another single day without Jesus. He's like, I had that life. It was hell on earth. Jesus, you got to let me come with you. And look how Jesus responds. But Jesus said, verse 19, no, go home. <laughs> You're kind of like, Jesus, I don't think that's great plan for discipleship right now. Like this guy, you know, he was demon-possessed, like demon, demon-possessed, naked, violent, murderer. And now he's come to know you, but like he doesn't really know anything like maybe you should come up with a better strategy. You know, the whole thing you're going to say in a few years, like go there for and make disciples of all nations. Don't you think that's this moment? Like, what are you doing, Jesus? But Jesus said, no, go home to your family. Tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. What's amazing is that this former naked demoniac is the first preacher Jesus ever sent out. This was before he sent out the apostles to preach. This was before he sent out the 70 disciples. This guy is the first one. Can you imagine him rocking up to a town? He's like, hey, I've got a God story I want, I want to tell you. You know, he's like, I don't know how to tell you this, but I used to be a naked maniac. It's the first person that Jesus sends out. He's not even Jewish. He's a Gentile. Murderer, violent, formerly demon-possessed psychopath. Now, what does this tell us? Um, I think Jesus is willing to use you, too. Yeah. It's kind of like, it begs the question, like, how qualified do I actually have to be to tell a God story to somebody? To be a witness for Jesus? Like, how much training do I actually need to go through? This guy had none, right? Essentially, almost Satan himself to now a witness for Jesus with about five minutes going by. Look what happens, verse 20. So the man started off to visit the 10 towns of that region. That's known as the Decapolis, Deca, 10 Opolis towns. The 10 towns of the region and began to reclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. He worked his way through these 10 towns, through these 10 cities. He really knew nothing but just his own testimony, his God story of what, like who he was the moment he met Jesus and how everything changed in his life. Now, the question for us is, was his testimony effective? Did it work? Fast forward a few chapters in Mark 7. We'll get there in a couple weeks, but Mark 7 verse 31 says, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of where? The Decapolis, those ten towns that naked homie went to. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and can hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. How did they know that Jesus could heal? Because this demoniac used the logic that Mark wanted him to, that Jesus wanted him to. He's like, hey, guys, like, this is my story. Jesus did this. He can do anything. If you ever encounter this guy, Jesus, just bring all your messes, bring all your problems to him. So Jesus comes to a place he hadn't been before, and guess what? Everyone's ready to receive and to reach out. He goes on, and in that same area, we see a crowd of over 4,000. That didn't even include women and children. So this is more like a crowd of like 12 to 15,000 people gathered around Jesus. They get hungry. Jesus does the miracle of feeding the 4,000. How did that happen? This guy just went around telling his God story. You got to meet this Jesus. If he, if he ever comes to town, go listen to him. This is what he did for me. I want to leave us with a couple questions. And the first question is this. Out of these four stories, uh, the storm, the demoniac, the healing of the woman, uh, the raising of the dead girl, who are you in these stories? It's an important question to ask yourself. Are you in a place where you need healing? Are you the guy that needs deliverance? Maybe not to the same degree but all of us have hangups in our lives. All of us have things, just like persistent temptations that seem to just always be there that we just kind of always find ourselves acting upon. Patterns of thinking, right? 
For some of you, it's like, I've just felt rejected my entire life and your whole worldview is rejection. You're just expecting everyone to reject you. You know how hard it is to fulfill the call of God on your life when you think every person's gonna reject you? Because if you think they're gonna reject you, it's really hard to love them. That's bondage. Who are you in this story? Are you the, the town that needs to value the work of God above your own convenience, above your own money, above your own comfort? Are you that guy that got set free and has a God story and, and Jesus just like, go. Don't just stay here, go. Like, you've got a story, go tell it. Who are you in this story? And then the, the second question is, what are you gonna do about it? If you need deliverance, if you need healing, are you gonna be humble enough to ask for it? Jesus, I need help. Are you going to come up and get prayer you know, after the service? What's going to be that next step for you? Are you going to ask for boldness from the Holy Spirit to share that God story? What is it? What are you going to do? Are you willing to take that next step? Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We're so grateful for this story, and, and we're so grateful. These were real people that were changed by you, Jesus. This wasn't just good narrative that would make a great movie. This is like real lives completely and radically changed. And we're so grateful for that, Jesus. And Lord, I'm just so grateful that, that you have all power and all authority and you choose every day to use it on our behalf to, to restore everything that death has touched. And Lord, we're gonna find out in a couple weeks you've commissioned us to do the same things you've done. And so, Father, I pray that we'd walk out of here with a fresh dependence upon you, but also a fresh boldness to do the things that you've done. And we pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen.